Hey Skeptics, it's Juliana here. Just a word of warning before we start this podcast. Today's episode discusses aspects of the white Australia policy and systematic and legal racism, which may be distressing and offensive for some listeners. Please proceed with caution and know that these views are not reflective of my own. It's the 12th of November 1934 in Melbourne, Australia. A large steamship, the Strathard, is surrounded in the harbour by boatloads of well-wishers, while the dock is packed with people, all waiting to see the same man. That man is Egon Kish, a Czechoslovakian communist and anti-fascist activist who has been banned from entering Australia. Bending over backwards to keep this undesirable out, the Australian government has forced him to stay on board the Strathard as it sails out of Australian waters. But the people who invited Kish to this country, and Kish himself, aren't so easily deterred. A lawyer boards the ship, accompanied by several of Kish's supporters, and serves the captain with a writ of habeas corpus, demanding that Kish be allowed to disembark. The court action is delayed, however, and Kish must stay on the ship while it is sorted out. If the Australian authorities have their way, the writ will be ignored and the frustrating Czechoslovakian activist will never set foot in their precious, conservative white Australia. The Great Depression is already causing enough damn problems, thank you very much, and they don't want a communist uprising to add to the mix. Like most people at the time, the authorities are terrified of communism, but they don't know what it is and they don't understand it either. It must also be said that Kitsch isn't here to start an uprising, whatever the conservative press is trying to claim. He's here as an anti-fascist activist to lecture about the horrors he personally experienced as a prisoner of the Nazis in Germany and to warn of the danger if fascism is allowed to spread. The following day... With the Strathard docked at the station pier and Kish still aboard the ship despite the writ, he makes his move. Australian immigration laws only apply to people still outside the country, including on board ships. If Kish can enter Australia, different laws will apply to him then and the government will have a harder time getting rid of him than if he stays on the Strathard. There are well-wishers at Station Pier too, and Kish gives them all a communist salute before he literally leaps into history. He jumps five metres from the deck of the Strathard, effectively entering Australia, landing on the dock, but breaks his leg in the process. Before his supporters can do anything, however, the police swoop in. Kish is carried back aboard the Strathard, and the Australian authorities... Breathe a sigh of relief. (sighs) Unfortunately for them, their relief is short-lived. Not even a month later, all their attempts to keep Kish out of the country have failed and the government is forced to reluctantly make a deal that allows the anti-war, anti-fascist activist to speak and lecture until he agrees to leave in March 1935. To add insult to injury, the government also grudgingly pays him £450 for his legal fees. What was it about Kish that drove the Australian authorities to go to such desperate lengths to keep him out? How did they do it? And what did the white Australia policy, the dictation test and, of all things, Scottish Gaelic have to do with it? I'm Juliana and you're listening to The Skeptical Historian Writes a Thesis. Hello again, my fellow skeptics, and thank you so much for joining me. Before we make our way into the murky world of the White Australia policy and its awful dictation test, I would like to acknowledge that I am podcasting today on the lands of the Wurundjeri Wathorong people. I recognise their history making on the land which we now call Australia and their continuous connection to country which they have protected and maintained for more than 65,000 years. 
Those of you who listened to the Australia Day special might recall that I mentioned something called the Dictation Test, which was part of the Immigration Restriction Act 1901. And this was one of the pieces of legislation which formed the White Australia policy. The purpose of the Immigration Restriction Act was to keep Australia British. Indeed, in 1934, when Melbourne celebrated its centenary of colonisation, although they framed it differently, the organisers used the slogan, Britain of the Southern Hemisphere, to describe the city. No mention was made of the long history of the Wurundjeri people prior to invasion, nor were they invited to participate in the celebrations. Melbourne, as far as the authorities were concerned, was a white city. Except it wasn't. Of course it wasn't. Despite the Australian government's insistence on maintaining whiteness and their cruel policies of deportation and exclusion, Australia was not and has never been an exclusively white nation. First Nations people have always been here, of course, but immigrants from all over the world, especially China, India and the Pacific Islands, had been coming here long before Federation and they continued to do so afterwards as well. Some of these people were wealthy and were able to buy their way in, while others had family who were able to vouch for their character or they had skills the nation needed. In some disturbing cases, people of colour were encouraged to immigrate or in some cases they were just purely kidnapped because they were needed for work that was considered too dirty or dangerous to be performed by white men, especially people from the Pacific Islands. They were often abducted, it was called blackbirding, to come and work on the sugarcane plantations in far north Queensland. Some were also brought to the big cattle stations up in the Northern Territory and these workers were forbidden to leave the properties or workplaces. They often Often lived in slave-like conditions, but it wasn't just restricted to far north Queensland or isolated cattle stations in NT. It did happen elsewhere as well. Indigenous Australians too were often quote-unquote employed, for lack of a better term, to do this work. And during the decades of the Stolen Generation, young Indigenous men who were taken from their families were usually employed as unskilled farm labourers. The designation of British and the White Australia policy, or I should say the Immigration Restriction Act, specifically defines the immigrants that Australia wants as British, was also troublesome for the rabid racists of the Australian government in the early 20th century. In their minds, a British person was a white person from England, Scotland or Wales, and the Irish could be included as long as they weren't Republicans. After Irish independence in 1921, the Irish actually began to occupy a grey area in Australian immigration law and the views of the government of the day tended to dictate whether the Irish were white enough, as it were, to enter Australia. Those from Northern Ireland, of course, were usually allowed in without trouble as they were still British. British also applied to any white descendant of administrators, soldiers or rulers in non-white British colonies such as India or Jamaica. However, the reality was that the term British in the 20th century, despite what successive Australian governments wanted to believe, actually applied to anyone living in Britain's vast cosmopolitan empire, regardless of the colour of their skin. This legal reality was not always there in practice, of course, but anyone who had a British passport was theoretically allowed to travel anywhere in the British Empire. White Australia did not want people of colour immigrating to their shores, but attempts to create overtly racist policies had always been knocked back by the British government, who, despite Australia being a dominion, they still had some say in their laws. They insisted that Australia as part of the British Empire, could not have laws which openly prevented other imperial subjects from entering. But laws which were more subtle could definitely be tolerated. Enter the dictation test. Now, by anyone's standards, even those of 1901, it was as blatantly racist as any other policy the Australian government had attempted to pass and protests against it were also immediate. But it was subtle enough to appease Britain and they stopped putting pressure on Australia. Under the terms of the Act, any person who, when asked to do so by an officer, 
fails to write out at dictation and sign in the presence of the officer a passage of 50 words in length in a European language directed by the officer was a prohibited immigrant and could be deported. The phrase any European language is important here because the test was specifically designed so that immigrants the Australian government didn't want coming into the country would fail. For instance, a Chinese immigrant might be given the test in Greek, but a Greek immigrant in this era pre-World War II, the British-Australian establishment was never quite sure if Greeks were white enough, might be given the test in French if the government wanted to keep them out. When people failed, they would be deported from Australia. As you can imagine, this test caused endless amounts of heartache and grief Sometimes even people who had been born in Australia and were therefore British subjects by birth were not safe if they had a Chinese, Indian or other non-white heritage. They were subject to controls that didn't apply to Australians of British or white European heritage and they had to apply for special exemptions from the dictation test if they wanted to leave Australia, say to go on a holiday or to visit family overseas. Sometimes they weren't given this exemption and when they came back, They were given the dictation test, they failed and were then deported from the country they had a legal right to be in and where their whole family and support network was. Families were broken up, lives were destroyed and Australia gained a not unfounded reputation as a racist, intolerant place. Now, I'm going to pause here for a break and when I get back, we're going to examine in more detail the story of Egon Kish, a man who created history, not to mention headlines, when he was given the dictation test. And I'm back. Now, if you live in Australia, especially if you live in Melbourne and have ever set foot in the Immigration Museum on Flinders Street, which is a fantastic institution, by the way, you have probably heard of Egon Kish, even if you don't know him by name. Kish was a Czechoslovakian communist activist who, in 1934, made an absolute fool out of the Australian government and its dictation test. Kish was multilingual and he only failed when he was given the test in Scottish Gaelic, or what the authorities claimed was Scottish Gaelic at least, but more on that in a moment. However, the dictation test wasn't the first tool the government had used to try and keep Kish out of the country. Today, the reasons for banning Kish make for deeply uncomfortable reading and even in 1934, there were serious questions raised about them. So Kish had been born in a German-speaking Jewish community in Prague, Czechoslovakia, which is now the Czech Republic and then was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He was a journalist who had been called up for national service during World War I and his personal convictions and his experience of war on the Serbian front had led him to communism and his journalism became highly critical of systemic oppression, both at home and abroad. He had gone to Austria and participated in the Vienna Revolution in 1918 and then moved to Berlin, where he wrote for a communist newspaper and became an active organiser within the Communist Party. Now, anyone who knows anything about history will know what's coming in Berlin. Unsurprisingly, this put him on the radar of the Nazis and their various paramilitary organisations. And following the Reichstag fire of 1933, which I have an episode coming up on that, so stay tuned, Kish was one of the many hundreds, possibly thousands, who were arrested by the Nazis as part of the so-called communist plot to burn down the Reichstag. Kish survived the Nazi prison, although he was deeply affected by both his own suffering and by having to watch his friends die slow and painful deaths. He did consider himself lucky. He was released from prison and expelled from Germany, where he returned to Prague and then moved to Paris with his wife. He continued to speak and write on both the evils of war and fascism. And in 1934, he was asked by the World Committee Against War and Fascism to address a conference being held in Melbourne by the Movement Against War and Fascism. Now, despite the similarity of their names, the two organisations weren't affiliated, but the Melbourne organisers had written to the World Committee asking for a speaker, and Kish agreed to attend. At the same time, the politically conservative establishment in London got wind that Kish, who they regarded as a dangerous left-wing firebrand, was heading for one of their dominions – 
Now, truth be told, Kish was a left-wing firebrand, but he was certainly not dangerous. He was coming to Australia to lecture on the dangers of fascism, to refute the lies about it being good for business and to promote peace. It is to the eternal shame of the British and Australian governments that they felt this was a man who should be excluded from the empire and to the further shame of the Australian government that they spent £450 of taxpayers' money trying to keep him out. This is roughly the equivalent of $26,500 today. The Australian government's only issue with Kish was that he disagreed with their policies and their conservative outlook. This was something that multiple newspapers actually pointed out over the four months the case dragged on through the Australian courts. And this disturbed not just the members of the Melbourne-based movement against war and fascism, but quite a few Australians who saw really uncomfortable parallels with regimes overseas where speaking out against the government was banned. Now, prior to Kish's arrival... The Australian government had already declared him a prohibited immigrant after receiving advice from London to keep him out, and immigration officials boarded his ship as it entered Fremantle in Western Australia and informed him that he was prohibited from entering the country. As we heard in the immersion at the beginning of this episode, this didn't stop Kish at all. Through a series of legal manoeuvres, Kish entered Australia for the first time legally in Sydney on the 16th of December, 1934, and was promptly arrested. The Australian government might have failed to keep him out by declaring him undesirable, but they had another trick up their sleeve, one that was designed to get rid of annoying people once and for all from Australia's shores. Yes, I am, of course, talking about the dictation test, but there was just one problem. The multilingual Kish, who was fluent in German, Czech, English, French and Hungarian and may have actually understood up to 12 languages, the records disagree, was likely to pass a dictation test. Enter Constable James Mackay, a Scottish immigrant who had not had to sit a dictation test when he arrived in Australia, who claimed to be fluent in Scottish Gaelic. He read Kish the Lord's Prayer in that language, which Kish did not speak, And when Kish failed the dictation test, he was charged with being a prohibited immigrant and told he would be deported. As you may have picked up about Kish at this point, he was the kind of man who did not go down without a fight. He immediately appealed and was granted bail, which meant he could finally address meetings and gatherings of fellow anti-war and anti-fascist campaigners. To the Australian government's horror, Their attempts to keep him out simply because they disagreed with him had only added to his popularity and huge crowds, sometimes up to 20,000 strong, turned out to hear him speak. Now, if the government had been sensible, they would have been wise to cut their losses at that point. But much like Kish, governments are generally really, really bad at knowing when to quit And the Conservative government of Australia in 1934, which was led by arch-conservative Joseph Lyons, was absolutely no exception. They wanted Kitch out of their conservative paradise and they were sure that a court would agree with them. And what's more, they had reason to believe this. Courts in Australia at the time were generally supportive of the White Australia policy and the dictation test in general, but the publicity surrounding Kish's case was unique. When it came to court, Kish's lawyer, unsurprisingly, called James McKay, the police officer who had given Kish the dictation test, and questioned him about his knowledge of Scottish Gaelic. McKay swore that he understood the language and had grown up speaking it, although he was forced to admit that it had been 20 years since he'd spoken it regularly. Now, this may have been true that he may have grown up speaking Gaelic, as there were and still are communities in Scotland where Gaelic is the primary language spoken alongside of or sometimes instead of English. And Mackay may very well have grown up in one of these communities, although I will say there's scepticism among historians about this, but it's one point that I'm not going to argue. I think we don't know enough about Mackay or where he came from to make that kind of judgment. Now, when questioned about how he could still be fluent in a language he hadn't spoken for 20 years, which 
is a valid question. McKay insisted that the length of time was irrelevant. He could still speak and understand what he claimed was his first language. The next witness Kish's team called was McKay's former supervisor, retired police inspector John McCrimmon and a fellow Scotsman. McCrimmon claimed that McKay was not only fluent in Gaelic, but that he was too, and that the pair of them had regularly spoken it to each other when they'd worked together. Now, given what happened next, this seems very unlikely. McCrimmon was presented with a passage in Scottish Gaelic and asked to translate it into English for the court. He translated, As well we could benefit, and if we let her scatter free to the bed. He was rather indignant after that, saying that it wasn't a very moral sentence, and he felt as if Kish's legal team were laughing at him. Now, as it was, they almost certainly were laughing at him because the passage he had just translated was actually the final line of the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. If nothing else, it proved that McCrimmon could not translate Scottish Gaelic to English, and it made McKay look bad too, but I do want to point something out here. Just because McCrimmon, and probably McKay too, couldn't read Scottish Gaelic or translate it into English, This is not proof that they didn't speak it. They may very well have done, but the dictation test required that the tester be fluent not just in speaking the language, but also be able to read and translate it as well. Those are different skills, and this should have meant that Kish's test was invalid. But it didn't matter. The court was conservative and on the government side and agreed that Kish had failed the dictation test and was a prohibited immigrant. Kish appealed this judgment and the government finally lost when the High Court ruled that Scottish Gaelic was not a European language for the purpose of the dictation test. This final part is important. Despite reports that still circulate today, the High Court did not say that Scottish Gaelic was not a language, simply that it couldn't be used for the dictation test. The newspapers, however, omitted this from their headlines and rather gleefully proclaimed things like Scottish Gaelic is not a language, says High Court Justice. Understandably, these reports caused a lot of anger among Australia's Scottish community and among the Scottish diaspora worldwide, not to mention in Scotland itself. Now, Kish was again free, although it wasn't long before the Australian government found another loophole in the Immigration Restriction Act. And this time, they succeeded in getting Kish to leave. They instituted further court proceedings, which overturned the High Court's ruling, and on the 26th of February, Kish was once again declared a prohibited immigrant, although there's no word on whether Scottish Gaelic was now allowed to be used in the dictation test. But rather than arrest him, the Lions government made a deal. If Kish would leave by the 11th of March, they would refund his court costs return his passport and remit his sentence. He had been given six months hard labour by the court for breaching the Immigration Restriction Act. Kish, who by this point had fulfilled his speaking arrangements and thanks to the publicity drawn by the Australian government's proceedings against him, had got even more attention for his cause than he'd dreamed possible, agreed. He left Sydney on the 11th of March and headed home to France. I'm going to take a break here. And when I get back, we're going to have a closer look at this dictation test, its prescribed use, and how it was actually used during the years of white Australia. Don't go too far. I'll be right back. And I'm back. As mentioned already in this episode, the dictation test was not meant to be passed. It was designed to be failed. Between 1901 and 1909, 1,359 people were given the dictation test and only 59 passed. They were the lucky beneficiaries of customs officials who didn't realise that the Immigration Restriction Act allowed them to test an immigrant as many times as satisfactory, that is, until they failed. Between 1909, when the laws were tightened, and 1958, when the dictation test was finally abolished, Not a single person given the dictation test passed it. Now, it is very interesting to look at the numbers here. Now, between 1909 and 1958, compared to the first eight years of the dictation test, only 641 people took the test. Foreign immigrants quickly learned to avoid Australia and its vicious state-sanctioned racism. 
And this started to cause some embarrassment to governments because by the 1920s, the Australian government wanted their country to be seen as this grand glowing jewel in the British Empire, a place that people were envious of. But the international community was comparing Australia to the deep south of the United States instead. That said, many Britons who were planning to immigrate were attracted to Australia and unfortunately the white Australia policy was one of the reasons they thought about immigrating there. However, for many British people as well, Australia was seen as a liberal paradise. Wages were higher in Australia than in Britain. There were no property restrictions on the franchise and there was universal white suffrage. Every man or woman over the age of 21 could vote by 1908, with Victoria being the last state to give white women the same rights as their male counterparts. An early form of women's suffrage would not arrive in Britain until 1918, and full women's suffrage wouldn't come until 1928. Female British immigrants also benefited from the high wages I mentioned earlier, and there were also many more job opportunities for them in Australia than there were in Britain. Now, the war had disrupted the labour market and despite government attempts, women were not happily downing tools and returning to their homes when the men came back from war. This was happening all around the world, in fact, but Australia had the added attraction for a lot of women and their families, particularly if they had been widowed by the war because the Australian government was encouraging immigrants to take up land and build houses and start farms. Now, for many people, this was completely out of reach for them in Britain. So plenty packed up and headed down south. Now, this suited the Australian government in the post-World War I period, and they threw open the borders as British migrants abandoned their tired old country and flocked to this new land that they hoped would be full of promise. None of them, of course, had to sit the dictation test. And by the 1920s, the Australian government was claiming that the purpose of the test was to ensure immigrants coming to the country were sufficiently educated. Now, nobody was fooled. And the newspapers regularly pointed out that the purpose of the dictation test was to restrict non-British, or at least non-white, immigration to Australia. It is strange to think about it now, but when it was used this way at the time, it was actually very popular among the Australian public, which I will say does not say much for them. And trouble tended to erupt only when the test was misused. Now, Kish is an example of this. Now, he wasn't British, but he was a white European man, which was all the racist thinking at the time said was needed to prove he wasn't dangerous. The Australian government's decision to try and exclude him by leaning on his politics would have had more success if he'd been a person of colour or hadn't been able to speak fluent English. Few Australians were sympathetic to communism at the time, but even fewer thought a white man could be a problem, even if he did disagree with the government. And anyway, wasn't Australia, as a British dominion, supposed to have free speech? Wasn't being able to speak out against the government one of the fundamental core values of being British? Most Australians are of the opinion that disagreeing with the government was okay. Although I will put the caveat in, just so long as the person doing the disagreeing was white. The racist view in the 1930s, that is white equals right, was also not unique to Australia or even the British Empire. And Kish also had sex on his side. He was a man, and it was perfectly acceptable for men to be loud, outspoken, and opinionated. And I also want to make it clear here, Kish was not doing anything wrong or illegal, and being an anti-fascist is an excellent political stance. After the Kish debacle, the government passed new laws, which meant someone arrested for being a prohibited immigrant was ineligible for bail, And they set about reassuring the now sceptical Australian public that they would only use the dictation test as it was intended to be used in the future. They'd rattled public confidence over the affair and plenty of white immigrants who had come to the country from continental Europe and who had been seen as white enough by the authorities not to have to sit the dictation test were worried they were just a whisker away from deportation themselves. 
The geopolitical situation, however, was on their side and it was Kitsch's politics the government had tried to exclude him over rather than the colour of his skin. Of course, plenty of immigrants, along with those people in Australia, had similar beliefs, but the Immigration Restriction Act could only be used to keep people out of Australia and there were no laws yet that allowed for the deportation and arrest of communists or other left-wing activists. Attempts would be made to pass such laws in the Cold War era and they had a lot of public support, but they never actually got through Parliament. Governments never had the numbers to pass those laws and communism was never illegal in this country. And it certainly wasn't illegal in 1934, which was another aspect of the Kish case that really upset the public. Why was the Australian government misusing laws against people who were not doing and had not done anything illegal. Now, the Kish case would not be the last time the Australian government got in trouble for misusing the dictation test, but more on that in another episode. But let's have a look at exactly what the dictation test was. The National Archives of Australia contains some of the passages that we used in the test, and I'm going to read two of them to you now. They're from 1925, but similar passages were used throughout the test existence. I'll read them in English, but it will give you a sense of the kind of tricks that were employed by government officials. So the first passage goes like this. The need for mental stillness, for quiet and balance, is obvious. People are too excited. Let us think how null and void our little revolutionary efforts are when tested by reality. Yet the fruitful results in our private lives and public efforts spring almost always from quiet reflection and mature contemplation. Another passage reads like this. Water as a liquid concerns us because our lives, like that of other living creatures, whether they be human, animal or vegetable, from the biggest mammoth to the tiniest microbe, are dependent on water. Therefore, as far as we know, where there is no liquid water, there can be no life. So the trouble with these passages might not be immediately apparent when read in English, especially if you are a tertiary educated native English speaker, which is the level of English these passages are written for, by the way. Let's look again. Like most languages, there are English words which sound the same but have very different meanings depending on the context. For example, in the first passage, the word reflection in this context means to look inward and consider one's actions. But reflection in another context can mean a reflection in a mirror. In some languages, this word will be the same but in other languages it will translate differently and could therefore have an entirely different meaning. The trouble with the second passage is that unless someone is trained in life sciences, they may not know the word microbe even in their own language, let alone in a foreign language test designed to trip them up. So these kinds of passages were deliberately chosen to make it harder for anyone who might be multilingual or who had even a basic grasp of more than one language to pass the test. Now, this strategy would have failed with Kish or somebody else like him because he spoke many languages and may have been aware of the subtleties between them. Now, by the time the dictation test was abolished in 1958, its shine had worn off with the Australian public. The post-World War II world had been shocked by the brutality of Nazi racism and countries which had enacted their own racist policies were scrambling to ensure their actions could not be viewed in a similar light. In the initial years after the war, Australia still had a preference for British immigrants. The famous £10 POMS program was one of the ways the government tried to encourage British immigration after the war. But the days of public acceptance of closed borders and openly racist rhetoric were over. The dictation test was used less and less frequently as immigrants poured in from Greece, Italy, Malta, Czechoslovakia, Germany, Belgium, Poland and elsewhere across Europe. Imperial British subjects such as Indians, although that country was fast heading towards independence after the Second World War, were able to come in greater numbers as the dictation test became a relic, as were the Chinese and Japanese. These communities had always been in Australia, of course, but the post-war immigration boom saw their numbers increase. 
in my opinion, this was a good thing and it paved the way for the cosmopolitan country we enjoy today. Now, it's not clear how many times the dictation test was used on these post-war immigrants, especially people of colour, but by the time it was abolished, it had barely been touched by the government for years. As Australia diversified and prejudices broke down, Australian people no longer supported the test or its racist overtones, and it died without fanfare when the Migration Act of 1958 was passed. The White Australia policy itself would continue its long, slow death until 1975, when the Whitlam government passed the Racial Discrimination Act. While this ended the formal, legal White Australia policy, it did not end racism in this country, nor did it undo the nearly three quarters of a century of pain and suffering that those policies had inflicted on prospective migrants and their families. It also didn't end the nearly 200 years of discrimination suffered by Indigenous people at the hands of both formal and informal policies linked to white Australia. Now, we still have a long way to go in undoing those knots and righting the wrongs of the past, but I think acknowledgement is always the first step. Before we close out today, though, there's one final question I think needs answering. What happened to Egon Kish? the outspoken Czechoslovakian Jewish communist and anti-war activist after he returned to France. Because, of course, I imagine most of us listening will know what happened to France not long after. Well, shortly after he arrived home, he left for Spain to fight for the government in the Spanish Civil War against General Franco, and he was able to escape before Franco's armies rolled in and ushered in 36 years of fascist dictatorship in Spain. Now, his experiences in the Spanish Civil War actually affected his communism and he came to believe, quite correctly, I think, that the Soviet Union, which was supposedly backing the Spanish government, was not truly communist and was instead a dangerous autocratic power that was more interested in oppressing the masses than freeing them from the tyranny of capitalism. He remained a passionate communist all his life, but his lectures later included not only the dangers of fascism, but of Soviet pseudo-communism as well. He returned to France after escaping from Spain, but he was devastated by the Munich Agreement of 1938, which saw his beloved homeland of Czechoslovakia swallowed up by Hitler's war machine. He was an anti-war activist, certainly, but that didn't mean that he was an appeaser, nor that he was a blind pacifist. In 1939, shortly after war broke out, Kish, who had become fearful for his safety in France, left Europe with his wife and they headed for the United States. However, just like in Australia, the US denied him entry, but he was able to get a transit visa and went to Mexico instead, and he remained there for the duration of the war. Now, he continued to write and lecture while in Mexico, and after the war, he was able to return to Prague and he settled there with his wife. He unfortunately died of a stroke in 1948, shortly before the Soviet-backed Communist Party of Czechoslovakia assumed authority after launching a coup. Now, after his death, the German Democratic Republic, which was anything but democratic, of course, East Germany and democracy did not go together, held Kish up as a hero, as did a lot of the Soviet bloc. Given that his lifelong struggle had been against repressive regimes which tortured and murdered their own people, I have no hesitation in saying that he would have been horrified by these regimes. He would have been furious that they had co-opted his name and angry that they were using selectively chosen parts of his work to back up what they were doing to their own people. His legacy in the West was more complicated due to his political beliefs and due to the constant marrying of communism with the Soviet Union, which they are different things. But his achievements in journalism, anti-war activism, and his determination to stand up for what was right meant he was generally remembered well. And listeners, I'd like to end this episode with a minute's silence in memory of Egon Kish, but also for all the victims of the White Australia policy who were separated from their friends and families, denied access to their home or prevented from finding safety due to the racist views of multiple successive Australian governments. So please join me now. <laughs> 
And that's it for today. Thank you so much for listening to the Skeptical Historian Writes a Thesis. New episodes are available every second Tuesday and can be found wherever you get your favourite shows. If you want to get in touch with me, you can head to my website, www.skepticalhistory.com. That's skeptical with a K. Or reach out on social media. I am Juliana Byers on both LinkedIn and Instagram. And join me next episode for another skeptical take on the mystery that is history. Bye now. The Skeptical Historian is researched, produced and hosted by me, Juliana Byers. You can find a full list of resources used in my research by going to my website and clicking on Sources. Sound effects are by Adobe Creative Cloud, Pixabay and Epidemic Sound used under the appropriate license. The music track The Whistle Funk by Telsonic was also used appropriately. Podcast hosting is by RSS.com. See you next time, skeptics.